Dobro jutro svima. Hvala Katarini na pozivu na ovaj kolokvij. Dakle, dopustite mi samo ovih prvih nekoliko uvodnih riječi na hrvatskom, a onda ću prijeći na engleski. Ja bih voljela, dakle, kao što i naslov moga predavanja danas govori, Bovi Schrader Tarantino, govoriti nešto o načinu na koji je Bovi zapravo pridonio hollywoodskom samorazumijevanju, odnosno samorazumijevanju Hollywooda. Prema tome, dakle, željela bih vidjeti kako Bovi funkcionira ne nužno samo iz muzičke glazbene perspektive, čak ni pop kulturne, nego prema nego prvenstveno prema Hollywoodu. Before I start, I would like to emphasize a a thing that I find very important for what we are doing today, because what we are doing today is not merely analyzing David Bowie, we are engaging here in an act of commemoration. Uh, and uh, it is an act not entirely identifiable as mourning, and certainly not as melancholia, even if we assume, and rightly so, that commemoration can be approached from within the same intellectual situation as mourning or melancholia. Uh, one could, in fact, work with a hypothesis that mourning is the middle ground between commemoration on the one hand and melancholia on the other. Because if mourning is the norm against which the pathology of melancholia can be analyzed, so says Freud, uh, then commemoration specifies what about this norm, what about mourning, is processed further into the communal and the political and the public. It is in this sense that commemoration designates above all mourning as politics, but also mourning as a peculiar political economy, which is different, however, from the political economy of melancholia. Also, it is from within commemoration that death can be addressed in terms of a genre, because it is in commemoration that death is processed as or into a genre which is how another argument actually becomes viable. The genre, the question of genre, could be understood in terms of commemoration, that understanding genres entails understanding the very logic of commemoration. David Bowie seems to invite, even demand, this line of reasoning because his entire career was structured around an exploration of the peculiar intelligence or the peculiar logic that goes into the making of genres or musical styles, of glam rock in the 1970s, of the 80s pop, of the millennial deconstruction of rock in the 1990s and later. In other words, what we tend to describe as Bowie's uncanny ability of transformation is perhaps an uncanny ability to engage in isolation that which constitutes a genre or a musical style and by extension that which constitutes commemoration. What is uncanny about Bowie, that is, <clears throat> is not his protean subjectivity, but rather his singular capacity to shed subjectivity in the position where subjectivity would necessarily contaminate the pure generic logic of musical styles that he wanted to bring out into the open. In Freudian terms, this means that Bowie doesn't cater to melancholia or to mourning, but to the death drive, because the death drive, according to Freud, designates precisely the law and the symbolic in a state of an impossible purity, or else the law and the symbolic in an impossible isolation from the, from the demands of subjectivity. And this is why casting David Bowie in terms of melancholia may be tantamount to missing out on David Bowie altogether. In order to explore this proposition, I would like to proceed with a brief analysis of Bowie's collaboration with Paul Schrader on Cat People, the film Schrader directed in 1982. It is a remake of the eponymous film directed by Jacques Tourner in 1942. And I hope that <clears throat> you remember the plot. Nastasia Kinski is cast as Irina, a young woman who arrives in New Orleans to visit her long-lost brother, 
only to find out that they are cat people, defined by their predatory sexuality and unable to resist shifting shape from man to leopard and back. As Irina is fighting her brother's incestuous urges, she falls in love with a zookeeper in New Orleans. She lets him in on her animal secret and implores him to kill her, as her death would put a stop to her transformation. Instead of killing her, he captures her after her transformation into a leopard and cages her in his zoo. Bowie contributed the song Putting Out Fire with Gasoline to Schrader's film. He later included the song in the album Let's Dance of 1983 and performed it on his serious Moonlight tour. It is true that this example appears to go against my initial proposition because Bowie's contribution to Schrader's project seems challenged precisely in terms of purity or isolation. First, Bowie's song appears to be contaminated by the cinematic framework to which he had to adapt. Second, it appears to be contaminated by the fact that Bowie contributed only the voice and the lyrics to the score which was pre-composed by Giorgio Moroder so that his music, or that the music that he performs in Schrader's film is actually not his own, not of his making. While this may seem to constitute a contamination so massive that Bowie seems hardly discernible in cat people, I would like to argue that the opposite is true. Namely, by bringing only his voice and lyrics to the film, Bowie localizes in Schrader a position where voice and language come together against or at the expense of images and music. He thus draws attention to a rift or a friction that persists in this film, or perhaps in film as such, the rift between the visual and the musical properties of cinema on the one hand, and the properties assembled round voice and language on the other. Interestingly, this is exactly the situation that Freud charts for the death drive. The death drive can be isolated in psychoanalysis and for it, only if voice and language are sequestered from the visual and the musical properties of discourse. What is more, by contributing the voice and the lyrics to the film, Bowie in fact points to a position where Schrader's Cat People, the film which wants to present itself as a Hollywood Gesamtkunstwerk, may be reduced to its narrative conditions. The implications of this particular insight are manifold and all of them singularly interesting. First, Bowie intuits in this fashion that Schrader's, uh, Schrader's significance for American cinema lies above all in his handling of the narrative that Schrader contributes, uh, contributes to Hollywood prim primarily as a narrator. This proposition is corroborated by Schrader's professional biography in which screenplays are at least as important as the films he ended up directing. One could go so far as to say that the importance of Schrader's directing is secondary to the overall significance of his, of his script writing. Secondly, while Schrader did not, uh, did not author the script of Cat People, his decision to direct a remake of, Tour of Tourner's 1942 horror classic testifies to his allegiance to classical Hollywood, the cinematic era distinguished precisely by the preeminence of storytelling, which then coincides with the reverence of classical Hollywood for genres. I'm alluding to the so-called invisible style of classical Hollywood, where narratives seem to take the day over editing and similar cinematic properties, the implication being that editing merely services a smooth presentation of the story. Finally, Bowie's intervention is again reminiscent of psychoanalysis because, because Freud granted to narratives the theoretical validity that proved constituent uh, to, uh, constituent to uh, psychoanalysis. In fact, it is with Bowie in mind that another line of reasoning becomes urgent. The one which suggests that the dead drive in psychoanalysis be analyzed alongside uh, Freud, uh, Freud's flair for narratives, because the two seem to be codependent. In turn, this is how another proposition is invoked. 
The narratives in classical Hollywood and in Schrader work similarly to narrative in psychoanalysis and should be granted theoretical validity. It is certainly symptomatic that Bowie's voice emerges twice in the film, in two different registers and in the positions where the story is decided, at the beginning and at the end. The film opens with his voice as mere murmur to Marauder's music, while the opening shot is focusing on the red African desert in whose sand human bones have been buried, as if to testify both to Africa as the cradle of humankind and to the birth of humanity out of the culture of sacrifice. What is more, the beginning explores the bad sacrifice, the sacrifice gone bad, because instead of fortifying the breach between the animal and the human, this sacrifice brings about the creation of cat people, of a mixture. While the opening focuses on the red African desert and human sacrifice, the closing shot is the one of Nastasia Kinski, reverting conclusively to her animal condition, now caged, thus accomplishing the split intended by the sacrifice in the first place and, integra and integral to it, the split between the animal and the human. The caging of Nastasia Kinski turned leopard equals in fact the division by which the human order is established at a remove or as a remove from the animal. Symptomatically, when Bowie's voice re-emerges at the end of the film, it is no longer reduced to murmur, but is a full-fledged voice, now a vehicle for the words that seem to complete the intended split between the animal and the human, as if the film arrived at its meaning only in the closure organized round language. In other words, Bovi's voice at the closure of cat people coincides with the healing of the death drive, which is now perceived as the cornerstone of humanity. While Bovi's initial murmur serves to bring out the sacrifice gone bad and the blurring between the animal and the human orders, so that no humanity can be isolated, his final breaking out into song designates the foundation of authority with the caging exposed as the condition of humanizing. In the song itself, Bowie assumes the voice of the caged animal, but speaks from the place where the terms of the caging are decided, with the assumption, in fact, that the voice is born out of these terms, out of the terms of the caging. He begins by describing the gaze as the stare of the animal, the stare which is intermittently green and colder than the moon, he says, and then red and burning. He climaxes, however, with the same stare faced with the law. The stare now designates a heart that cannot mend, caught in a judgment, made an unbending, says Bowie. It is to these eyes, faced with the law, that tears are blue and unstoppable, blue now designating color as much as unhappiness. What Bowie recreates here is in fact the structure of William Blake's The Tiger from Blake's Songs of Experience. He even takes over Blake's phrases and images, for instance, the one about the tiger burning bright in the forests of the night, whose fearful symmetry cannot be, for, uh, cannot be framed by an immortal hand or eye, uh, thus Blake. Yet, just like Blake's tiger, Bovis leopard, too, is caught in the experience, that is to say, in the fall and the sin and the law. This is why the fire this animal brings into this world, be it fire as passion or fire as destruction, never quite coincides with itself, but serves to designate excess and transgression. Hence, every attempt to put it out equals putting out fire with gasoline. Schrader matches this logic by carefully reinstating from within his film the cinema of the 40s and the 50s. If his story <clears throat> in broad strokes is taken over from Tourner, his color scheme and lighting, <clears throat> sorry, as well as many visual figures are taken over from Hitchcock's thrillers. 
Schrader thereby preserves the generic emphasis of classical Hollywood, but also contributes a comment on American cinema in the wake of New Hollywood in the 1970s. If New Hollywood was about breaking the rules of classical Hollywood, the, Amer the American cinema of the 1980s is evidently about reinstating those rules, which to Schrader is tantamount to addressing the question of species and the law. I would like to argue that Quentin Tarantino's decision to use Bovis putting out fire with gasoline in Inglorious Bastards 27 years later entails the same grouping with Bowie as the linchpin. The story is set in the Second World War and focuses on a young Jewish girl, Melanie Laurent, uh, cast as Shoshana, who escapes the Nazi persecution by assuming the identity of a non-Jewish Parisien who owns a cinema theater. In Tarantino too, like in Schrader, Bowie's song surfaces at a turning point. It marks the transformation of, Mel uh, of uh, Melanie Laurent, Shoshana, uh, from a subdued citizen into a cinematic diva, which coincides with her decision to stage a massive fire in her cinema theater and burn down the entire Nazi elite. This changes the course of the world war and effectively ends it. It is also the moment when Shoshana transforms herself into a sacrifice. Most importantly, perhaps, this is also the moment when the story, which fed on the historical structures and historical plausibility, takes a turn for the counter-archival and, and the fictional. In other words, it is at this point, with Bowie as catalyst, that Tarantino replaces history, or historicity, with ritual structures and sacrificial violence. Again, this is also the moment when the death drive is restored or reinstated along with the restoration of proper sacrifice, suggesting that the Second World War had a structure of bad sacrifice in which the death drive was effectively replaced by perversion. In Tarantino, the sacrifice goes bad when humanity is pressed into recreating the conditions of Schrader's beginning so that some people, in this case the Jews, are promoted into a kind of animal-human contamination. Indeed, Tarantino's Shoshana even physically resembles Schrader's Nastasia Kinski. Not only are the two actresses similar, his, their faces are similar, uh, with a vestal, if not virginal, quality about them, they also both vacillate between their assumed human identities and the contaminated identities that invite persecution. Also, like Schrader, Tarantino reverts to the cinema of the 1940s, but now in order to address the logic of Nazism, as if to, <clears throat> as if to insist that there is a structural link between the cinematic logic of classical Hollywood with its various European siblings and relations and the imaginary of the Second World War. If this is how American cinema addresses itself as a semiotic hub critical to understanding the 20th century humanity. My contention, in conclusion, or instead of one, is that David Bowie is as critical to this semiotic operation, to our understanding of the 20th century modernity, now in the position where he demands that modernity be understood in terms of intelligence or of the logic of the death drive. Thank you. <clears throat>